Hello and happy Friday. Welcome back to another fascinating episode of Find My Past Fridays, our weekly live show about all things family history and all things interesting to family historians. So it's very nice to be back. I'm Alex Cox, as usual, your host. I'm joined off camera by lovely Max Anderton, who, as usual, is keeping a close eye on all the comments, questions, tips, tricks, shout outs, hellos, anything you send in. So yeah, we're here to talk to you. Uh, so join the conversation, don't be shy, get in the comments. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day in London today. Oh, it's lovely. It's cracking the flags, so we're all looking forward to the weekend. But let us know where you're watching from and what the weather is like. We're British, we're obsessed with weather, it's just, it's in our blood. Um, so yeah, tell us what you're up to at the weekend. I imagine most people in England will be watching the England match on Sunday, which leads me nicely on to our theme this week, of course, yes, as the nation, and actually not just the nation, the world, is gripped with football fever. Of course, the World Cup is in full swing. We thought we would turn our attentions to all things sporting. So this week is a sporting-themed episode. And in, in that spirit, our question of the week is, tell us about the, the sporting achievements of your ancestors. Were any of your ancestors sportsmen, or sportswomen for that matter? Did they, they don't have to have been professional. They could have played for an amateur local team. They could have played for a, a school team. But yeah, we want to hear about them. And even better, if you've got any photos, Please send them in as well. We'd love to see some photos. Funny you should say that, Alex. Funny I should say that. Um, uh, Nick Hancock. Hello, Nick, if you're <laughs> Hello, watching. Nick. Uh, Nick actually uh, posted in the comments before we went live, and he's got a picture. I'm just going to bring it up on the screen alongside your heads here. I, I um, haven't seen it, unfortunately. I'd love to see it. It's a fantastic picture. It's um, it's Nick's uh, grandfather uh, playing in an army football team. Oh, cool. Uh, for World War II. Uh, I'm just going to bring up another one, actually, which is a bit more of a close-up. So you can see this here. Is, it looks a bit weird, actually, because it's covering the top half of you as if you're sort of three people now. But the chap in the green box, that's Nick Hancock's grandfather. Oh, wow. Um, so thank you very much thanks, for sending Yeah, that thanks, in. Nick. That's great. And more of that. If anybody else has similar photos, you don't have to send in a photo. Just tell us about your sporting ancestors. Also, similarly, if you have any uh, tips for searching for sporting ancestors, that's one of the things I'll be covering this week. But yeah, if you have any tips of your own, share them. Let us know. Have you, have you, how have you found your sporting ancestors? Was anything... Was there anything that came in particularly useful? Uh, so yeah, what am I talking about this week? So I'll start off with sharing a few very general tips for searching for sporting ancestors. And the next section is a bit Max and I have had tons of fun with, where we were scouring through our newspaper collections to find some weird and wacky sports from days gone by. We found five completely bonkers pastimes that prove that our Ancestors were generally pretty mental. They were pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, and then after that, I would like to just share a story about a sporting hero who I believe is a bit of an inspiration and whose story should be more widely known. So I'll be finishing with that. So if you're just joining us, uh, this is your host on the screen, Alex this Cox. This is your host, Alex Cox. Uh, my name is Max Anderton, um, and Alex is going to be giving you some tips for finding sporting ancestors. He is then going to be talking about some crazy sports they from yesterday. They are pretty crazy, and we've got some great pictures of them as well to show you. And then we're talking about particularly um, an amazing sporting <laughs> hero. Yes. Um, and also, I just want to say hello to lots of people. So, oh, yes. Hello, Tom. Hello to Sue. Hello to Patricia. Hello to uh, another Sue, Sue Adams. Um, oh, they're all flying in now, so I'm losing <laughs> from before. But hello to everyone that said hello, and also special hello to Claire watching from Malaysia. Oh, nice. Hello, Claire. I wonder what, what time is it in Malaysia, Claire? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. In. Sounds like you might be quite dedicated. And we've got here, this is really cool, actually. Uh, Lindsay Lee Woods has just come in to say, my two times great uncle Frank Woods played for Manchester United Reserve team in the 40s. Oh, wow. And after that, Berry FC. Oh, cool. That's pretty cool. I mean, as a scouser, I have to say, boo. <laughs> but still, that, that no, that's amazing. Um, thank you very much for sharing. So, how... Um... I I'm sorry, I keep... This is That's the reason why right. you never get anything done, it's because <laughs> of me. Um, but I was also going to say, Claire has just said, uh, I had cousins from one family who were amazing. One was captain of the All Blacks. Oh, wow. Two sisters were national champions in swimming. Another brother, who ended up being Chief Justice of New Zealand, was also an excellent cricket and rugby player, and other siblings were local reps in various sports, such as hockey. So you've got some seriously strong sporting genes there. Yeah, I must see. Oh, anyway, wow. Sorry, on you go. Uh, so yeah, so how, how do you go about searching for sporting ancestors? Well, the obvious one, first, first thing to suggest, would be newspapers, you know? Most of the newspapers on Find My Past are local newspapers, and local newspapers 
generally had sporting pages and they wouldn't just be covering professional fixtures they'd be covering you know uh, amateur local matches wh whether it be cricket rugby football but they'd also talk you know cover uh, school and university matches as well so yeah if your ancestor was the captain of a school cricket team you might find details of their performances in one of the newspaper uh, articles well and also actually one of the things i do find this pretty interesting not that long ago we did a little bit of a test to see what people were searching for on our sister site, the British Newspaper Archive, because of course the newspaper archive isn't just used by family historians, it's used by people with all kinds of interests. And we did find that football was one of the most searched for terms in the whole archive. So people really do seem to use it to get, you know, really get, do some really deep exploration of the history of their local clubs. And if anyone watching has done that, we'd love to hear a bit more about what you've found and how, how you go about it. But yeah, there's so much about it. I mean, actually, I did find quite a funny article about the World Cup today uh, in the British newspaper archive. So in 1934, this is my favourite World Cup fact. And if anyone else has any good World Cup facts, get them in the comments. Uh, but uh, in the, the 1934 World Cup, Britain refused to go. Uh, we, 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 we decided we weren't sending a team. But the reply was actually quite rude. So FA Association Committee member Charles Sutcliffe called the tournament a joke. And his, <laughs> his response, he said... The national associations of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland have quite enough to do in their own international champion, which seems to me to be far better than the world champion being staged in Rome. Wow. Quite that biting. seems pretty crazy. Unnecessarily vicious. But yeah, yeah. so that's my favourite World Cup. We, not only did we not go, we sent a rather rude response. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so... Maybe if we, if we keep on never winning, maybe we'll do that again. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We're too busy. We've, <laughs> we've, we've, uh, we've got our own international fixtures. England versus Scotland, you know, that's better than... We didn't want to Brazil. win anyway. No, we didn't want to win anyway. So, yeah, newspapers, obviously, and not just local newspapers as well. There are lots of dedicated sporting titles on, on, on both Find My Past and the British Newspaper Archive. So you've got things like the Sporting Times, the Sportsman, personal favourite of mine, the Cricket and Football Field. Uh, there's tons. And if your ancestor was a professional athlete or... or, or or a keen sportsman, it's very likely that their name will appear in a, in a report in one of those publications at some point. So definitely worth checking. But if you're not having any, um, having any success off online, um, offline methods could include family photographs, like the one that was sent in before. Um, you might have a photo of your ancestor in a, in a sports kit. And you might not know much about it, but by doing a little bit of Google sleuthing, uh, you might be able to pick out some clues which give you a better idea about where they were, what they did, and, you know, all this kind of stuff that helps us get a richer idea of who our ancestors were and what their lives were like. So um, you could also try contacting a local archives or family history society because lots of them will have old photographs of local sports teams. So I know, for example, one of our good friends, Sarah Williams, who's the editor of Who Do You Think You Are magazine, she actually did this and had quite a bit of success and was able to find uh, photographs of her ancestor in the school cricket team and in, in the hockey and football teams and things like that. So it's certainly worth doing. And on that note as well, our, our collection of national schools, admission registers and logbooks uh, are another great place to find out if your ancestor played for a school sports team. If your ancestor was captain of the rugby squad or something, you might find a note in one of the logbooks. Um, and apart from that, really, any occupation that lists, uh, sorry, any record set that lists occupation. If your ancestor was a professional athlete, they may have listed that as their occupation. So, for example, the 1911 census has 66 professional footballers in it, which is not as many as I would have thought, actually. Because, you know, by 1911, football was a popular sport. But I guess it goes to show that back then, a lot of these professional football players were still working down the local factory and wouldn't have considered it as their main job. Um, so, yeah, apart from censuses, you, you know, things like business di uh, post office directories and almanacs, military service records, even parish records, you know, sometimes parents' occupations were listed. Um, so yeah, anything that really lists occupation. Um, and, and as a bonus feat mention as well, um, during the First World War, I'm sure you're all familiar with the history of PALS battalions, but there are actually a number of sporting PALS battalions raised. So there are a number of football battalions, but we actually have records for the first sportsman battalion of the Royal Fusiliers on Fire My Past, and that's a dedicated collection just for that battalion listing all the members and there are quite a few famous athletes of the day in there so it's it, it, you might not have any ancestors in there but still it's an interesting collection to have a play around with so yeah those are my general overall tips for tracking down sporting ancestors if anyone watching has any better ones or more precise ones or have thought of something i haven't mentioned please do get them in the comments 
Um, it's, it's really cool, actually. We've uh, got a comment here from Mark Warburton. Hi, Mark. Um, he said, Grandad completed athletics for Cheshire. Oh, cool. uh, but struggling to find any articles. So hopefully some of the advice that you've just given there about the local archives and yeah, things like that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if, yeah, if you're struggling to find... Mm, I'm, wonder, I'm not quite sure what our coverage for Cheshire is, actually, in the newspaper archive. But yeah, if you're struggling to find anything in the newspapers, definitely worth contacting the local archives or Family History Society. May well find something. I'll tell you what, Mark, if you let us know the name of your granddad. Oh, actually, yeah, we'll have a little look. We'll have a little look in time for next week. There's no promises here. No but promises. We'll certainly but have a little let look. us know the name uh, and we'll certainly have a dig around. And um, the date, the, the, the time period as well. Also, uh, Nicole Hassel. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Uh, she says, Hi, boys. The only sports in my family was karate for my granddad and uncle. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That is, they must have been quite early practitioners. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. So, have you found anything, Nicole, about it? I would have thought someone, your granddad doing karate would have been a bit of an oddity. Yeah, I don't think it really took off until like the 70s and 80s. So, yeah. if they were doing it earlier than that, they could have been at the forefront of British karate. Exactly. Yeah, Bruce Lee, sort of, not that he was really doing karate, but that popularised it, didn't it? That made all the karate yeah, schools that's open. Everyone wanted to do so Nicole, let us know. Have you got any any anything in print from back in the day with your granddad doing karate chopping? Hiya. Um, so now up for the bit I've been really looking forward to, which is the five insanely wacky sports from yesteryear. And these are to, 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 these are so crazy. Some of them you might doubt, but to prove all of these are true, we're going to show you some pictures and examples we found in our newspaper collection. And Max is also going to post links to some of the original articles, so you can actually read more about these wacky sports because. Most of them, I couldn't believe it when I came across this. So the first one is my favourite on the list, but definitely not the craziest, which was the popular 1920s sport of balloon jumping. And this, in yeah, so, it, I mean, is the image up on screen? Have we got the image up yet? Yep. Yeah, it's literally what you're seeing there. So we all know the 20s, in the 20s, people were loved futurism it was an age where people were thinking about the future and what was more futuristic than flight so a few dead a few kind of experimental daredevils worked out that by attaching themselves to small floating balloons by using the muscles in their legs they could and you know doing some powerful leaps they could kind of do this giant moonwalk thing across the countryside uh, and it started in the united states and did make its way over to britain and got it actually got quite popular and one of my favorite facts about this was that uh, in england the the gas used was hydrogen they actually used incredibly flammable height they strapped they strapped themselves to explosive balloons and jumped over houses like i mean that's crazy but in america they used helium um, because it wasn't so combustible. And when I looked into this, the reason they used helium wasn't because they were worried about exploding. They used helium because they wanted to be able to smoke while they were floating through the sky, which just conjures up some absolutely wonderful images, I think. And so sports publications during the 20s like absolutely fawned over this. They, they thought it was brilliant and they described, literally it was described as safe, easy and fun. Uh, I'd really debate the safe uh, element. Fun, I reckon it would be great fun, uh, but it was definitely not safe because it largely fell out of favour in the UK in 1927 because of the most famous British balloon jumper, a Sergeant Frank Dobbs, an ex-military man and a skilled parachutist, tried, basically got a bit ambitious, showing off his balloon jumping skills. He attempted to jump over some power lines and was electrocuted to death in the process. And then after that, the sport was largely abandoned. But the image we had up there was great because you can actually see their trajectories, can't you? Dotted out. Oh, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's quite hard to see. And I imagine being streamed on Facebook is going to be very yeah, hard to see. Yeah, we're posting a link to the actual image in the comments. So but it's it so detail. cool. It's got these little dotted lines showing where they've bounced and where they're going to land yeah. next. And another detail I like as well is the, the, the jumper in the forefront of the picture. You might be able to see that he's detaching a bag from his waist. And that's because the more experienced balloon jumpers would carry bags of ballast around their waist. And if they needed a little bit of extra lift, say they were heading for some power lines, they'd remove, the, they'd cut these bags free and get a little extra boost. So yeah, there you go. It happened. It was popular. And the illustration you see there, the headline's great. It says, the human aeroplanes of the age, a graphic illustration of the latest daredevil sport from America. And uh, what you're seeing in that image is an impression of balloon jumping at Stag Lane Edgeware. Uh, so yeah, it, it happened, and apparently it happened at Stag Lane on Edgeware. Cool. So let's move on. Quick, I need so, to. I'm, I'm being mindful of time now. We're 15 minutes in, just so you know. I'll rattle through uh, the other ones quickly. And, and just so you know, watching, we're, we're planning always to try and come cutting up 
30 minutes yeah. uh, maximum because um, we know you've got other things to be doing on a Friday afternoon um, but Not it's really nice to see all the, all the comments that we've had uh, coming through um, of people whose uh, yeah, relatives uh, sporting people the comments have just gone down oh, wow. to quick for me to see but um there's so obviously a lot of sporting ancestors out there then. Yeah, but I've just seen, sorry, I've missed the name now, but I think it was Patricia actually trying to um, add a photo. We asked for photos. Annoyingly, my fault, so I've just realised. While the video is live, while we're live, you can't, for some reason, you can't add a photo to a comment. Oh. So we have to wait. Once this video is over, if you you know, if you know, don't mind, or over the weekend or something, if you want to add oh, it to I, it. We'd love that, because then we could come back and revisit them yeah, next we can week show, and we, we can could do a little slideshow. Maybe we can get, maybe we can get one of the experts in the house to you know, give some insight into oh, the pictures yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, please do. So yeah, if you can't post them now, do wait to the end and post them. So uh, the next one on the list is... It doesn't sound that wacky, but it's the history of it that's so crazy. Pugilism, which is obviously the, the precursor to modern day boxing. Uh, and the reason I think it's so bonkers is because these matches were so hardcore. Um, if, you, if you type in pugilism in, in the newspapers, you'll find loads of reports of matches. And these matches would go on indefinitely. Obviously, they weren't wearing any gloves. These, you know, they were f f typically fought by you know, hard men from factory, you know, late, manual laborers and stuff like that. And these guys would just slog it out for hour upon hour upon hour. And some of the descriptions are so graphic. You know, you've got things like, by the 15th round, Prig had lost six teeth and was bleeding profusely from both eyes. And you know, like, they went on for another 12 rounds. And actually, get this, the record for the longest bare knuckle pugilist bout was listed as six hours and 15 minutes between a James Kelly and Jonathan oh, Smith in Victoria, Australia in 1855. Smith finally gave out after 17 rounds. You know, so it's so crazy. But the guy who was responsible for it all was an English man called James Fig, who kind of really... He, he claimed the first world, uh, the first bare knuckle champion of England title in 1719 and really was the forefather of the modern sport. So he set up a pugilistic foundation where he started to kind of, you know, make rules and formalise things. Uh, so, yeah, boxing in its modern form, kind of a British invention. And there's another great article I found, which Max is going to post in the comments. I'm not going to read it out. A report uh, which was printed in the papers in 1829, where basically a French newspaper described the Brits as a load of th as a load of thugs. And we saw it as a badge of honour. But the Brits <laughs> saw it as a badge of honour. So the article's titled French Compliment to the Englishman. And the article basically goes on about how Brit um, Englishmen were pugilists from birth and they always solved things with violence and missing teeth is a common sight. And they just <laughs> very, very, uh, very, very subtly just go, things are done differently in France. But uh, yeah, we took it as a compliment. So Max will post that in the comments and I'm sure we'll have great fun with that. I know the way I said, post it in the comments so we can speed through it. And then he basically just described the whole thing anyway. <laughs> right, next, next, next. Sorry, moving next, you along. Uh, motor polo. Motor polo. Another crazy sport. And I, literally, as you can imagine, it was polo with cars. Exactly the same rules, exactly the same method of playing, but they played it with cars rather than horses. And as you can imagine, it was insanely dangerous. Insanely dangerous. So it started in 1912 when a Kansas Ford dealer wanted to attract more business. So he arranged a motor polo match outside his dealership and uh, eventually it made its way over to England. It was, uh, yes, it started in the US in 1912 and then made its way over to England in 1913. Um, and it, it actually makes sense because when you think about the era, cars were starting to be considered as a viable replacement for horses. So it kind of makes sense that people were experimenting with playing polo in cars. It's like, well, what do we used to do with horses? Let's do all of that yeah. with cars. And, you know, it, it got off to a shaky start because the article you can see here was from the Illustrated, Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. And basically what it, what, what it says is that the, the, this was the first ever motor polo match in Britain and it was described by other, pa uh, other papers as a painfully dull affair. And the report actually says that the thousands of spectators who were there at the start of the match very quickly abandoned it for a game of traditional polo which was going on in the adjacent field and uh, the reporter ends with it is unlikely that Uncle Sam has made good this time with his new petrol sport but <laughs> they were wrong because it did become very popular despite the serious risk of maim being maimed uh, it, it became very popular and the last game was actually in the late 1950s so 
There so, you go. Sounds, sounds like something out of Top Gear, doesn't it? It really does. Um, so we've got two more. Um, two more. Next, next, two next. More. Wax bullet dueling. This one's another great this one. This one so is really cool. You all know the history of dueling. It was a big part of American and European culture for quite a long time. You know, uh, duels were an established way of solving differences, albeit maybe not a legal one. And if a man refused to fight in a duel, women fought duels too, but if, if a person re refused to duel, their honour would be tarnished and they'd be a social pariah. But for a while, dueling was actually a popular spectator to sport. Of course, they weren't using real bullets, they decided to use wax bullets instead, and participants would face off against each other in black robes with face masks, point, shoot, uh, and it was so popular that it was actually an event, it was, it was an event at the 1908 Olympic Games. Wax, duel, wax bullet dueling was a, an Olympic event, and it, it came out of Paris, there was a school of dueling, and the rules were based on the traditional honour codes, but anyway... I feel like I, if, if I had some proper goggles... I'd be really up for doing it. It sounds really fun. It was dangerous. Oh, really? I mean, the, 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 these, these, wa the, these wax bullets were still leaving the guns at an incredible velocity. And if you got hit, you know, a, a stray chunk of wax could ease, and they, the bullets would fragment as well. So they, people in the crowd might get hit, and a stray chunk of wax could easily remove an eye. Uh, and, and as a testament to that, the man you're seeing here is Mr. Walter Winnens, the world, the world champion for double shots in 1908. And uh, yeah, it's an interview with him with the headline, What It Feels Like To Be Shot At. So Walter Winnens was obviously quite a daring man. In, in the interview, he, he's very blasé about the risk and goes, oh, you know, you don't really think about the nerves, you just want to win. But then he does admit, he says, there is, however, a very real danger with wax bullets. Uh, when I first tried it several years ago, I shot out the so soft piece of flesh connecting the thumb and forefinger on the right hand of Mr. Gustave Voltilquin, the well-known French sporting writer, and he tells me it still pains him to this day. So, not all safe, but I just, he, doesn't he look cool? He looks crazy. Can you hold it up? You mean this bit? Basically, he, he blew oh, a hole in his can there. Oh, that's cringy. Oh, dear. Yeah. And, and Nick Hancock's just said, uh, it sounds basically like the gun version of fencing, which came from dueling. It's yeah, almost like that's, a, that's a middle what step. And they went, actually, no, let's get rid of the guns I think maybe entirely. this is a bit much. Maybe yeah. this is a bit much. And last but not least, definitely the cruelest entry on the list. Or, as Sue Kelly just said, like paintballing. Actually, kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a more painful, a more, yeah, a more dangerous paintballing. Um, so... But, well, yeah, and the difference was they're still using re real pistols with real powder. Yes. So that's yeah, the yeah. difference. And someone could uh, switch over the bullets. I'm anyway. sure mistakes were made. You never know. Uh, but last but not least, we're ending the list. With, we're ending this list with a tragic little bit of animal cruelty. But this one is so crazy, we had to include it. This was the old 70, uh, 18th century sport of fox tossing. Yes, you heard that right. Sadly, in uh, 18th century Germany. Uh, Fuchsbrennen, or fox to tossing, was a very popular sport amongst the aristocracy. And as you can see by the image we've got up here, the idea was that people would split into teams of two. Um, they'd stand on either side of the playing field and hold a tarpaul, a length of tarpauling between them. Then the, hunt the huntsman would release a bar open a basket full of badgers and foxes, which would be chased across the field, and the teams would wait until the fox or badger got onto their tarpaulin, and then they'd yank it as hard as they could, and basically the person who was able to toss the most foxes and achieve the greatest height won. Um, and there's actually a link to an article, uh, a longer article, on the history of fox tossing in the newspapers, which we'll post in the comments as well, so you can read more about I it. I wonder if you got bonus points if they squished when they landed. Oh, I dread to think, probably. It does sound pretty great, So, yeah, it? that was our wacky, weird, bonkers sports from days gone by. As you can see, they were pretty crazy. If anybody's thought of any we haven't included on the list, I mean, everyone knows about cheese rolling and bog snorkeling and things like that, pop them in the comments. Let us, let us know. know. And if you are just joining us late, don't worry. You can watch the whole thing back afterwards, and Alex has run you through tips for finding sporting ancestors. We've actually had a couple of good tips in the comments from people as well, and we've just gone through a list of wacky sports from yesteryear very wacky sports from yesteryear and then coming up now just to finish off and now let's just let you know you have six minutes left um we're going to talk about one of a uh, bit of an unsung hero really yeah so this uh some of you may have actually be familiar with him this man's name is walter tull and the reason i wanted to talk about him was because we actually did a campaign about him in 2013 to try and get him the recognition he deserved because he was a fascinating man who had a very difficult life but you know was a very obviously a very high achiever so not only was Walter the first black officer in the British Army he was also one of the first black football players to play in the top division of the English football leagues um, yeah he had a very hard life he, his father was um, a Barbadian carpenter and his mother was uh, from Kent but his mother died when he was seven his father remarried and had three more children and then his father died 
Uh, and when his father died, his, mother, uh, his stepmother gave him and his brother away, basically, and he was sent to an orphanage at the age of just only nine years old. Uh, his brother was adopted by a medical family from Glasgow and became Britain's first black dentist. But Walter wasn't so fortunate. He remained in the orphanage for the rest of his childhood. That was until he was signed by Tottenham Hotspur in... What year was it? Uh, at the age of 21. Um, and he was a very talented football player. He made an impression on the pitch very early on. The fans of his team absolutely adored him because he was such a, such a strong player. Opposition fans weren't so kind, and even after, even after performing very well, after only about 10 games he was in first teams, he was moved into the reserves, mainly because of the terrible racial abuse he was getting at the hands of opposing fans, the worst of which was actually by fans of Bristol City. And another interesting side note about it was this was actually covered, about, covered by in the papers. So if you search, the article was headed Football and the Colour Prejudice, and this is largely believed to be the earliest, the first ever journalistic report on racism in sport um, and the journalist basically remarked that he, 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 he dealt with this abuse so well he said he remained professional and composed despite intense provo provocation, provocation he's hotspur he's hotspur's most brainy forward so clean in mind and method as to mod as to be a model for all men who play football he was hands down the best forward on the field but anyway he was also very patriotic he was the first member of uh, the Northampton town football team who he moved, went on to play for to join the British Army in early 1914. He answered the call of Queen and Con King and Country very early on, fought at the Battle of the Somme and rose to the rank of Lance Sergeant before being getting a battlefield commission in 1917 to become a second lieutenant, making him the first black officer in the history of the British Army. And this is where history gets slightly interesting because um, he, he, he fought in football battalions actually, he fought in football pals battalions, so he was fighting with other footballers um, and he was he he was very brave so in um he mainly fought on the Italian front and once led um, 30 men in a daring night raid across rapids and successfully brought them all back for which it was noted that he should have been given the uh, military cross but he was sadly killed in action um, during the first battle of Bapaum uh, in the early stages of the German, German army's spring offensive and despite the best efforts of Leicester um, of um, Leicester Foss, the go goalkeeper, um, sorry, the Leicester Foss goalkeeper, Tom Billingham, who is in the same regiment, despite his best efforts to drag Walter's body back to British lines, uh, Walter's body was never recovered. But this is where it gets interesting. So anyway, uh, a letter, in a letter of condolence sent to Walter's family, the commanding officer mentions that Walter had been uh, recommended for the military cross, an award he was never given. And w historians believe this was because at the time, Walter shouldn't have been made an officer. The British Army Military Manual clearly stated that British officers had to be of 100% European descent, um, which Walter wasn't. But of course, by 1917, the army was desperate for men. So, you know, I'm trying to think of the word. Exceptions were made and Walter was made an officer. And many historians believe the reason he wasn't given this military cross meant, was because it meant that the, all, the, 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 the top brass would have had to acknowledge the fact that they made him an officer when, according to military law, they shouldn't have. And also it would have val validated his status as a British military officer. So considering his conduct on the battlefield, it's a travesty he didn't get his award. Um, I mean, if you look at the pictures, I think he, he, he just he looks like a very... He has a kind face. And I think, yeah, just a... An amazing man who led an incredible life and despite all the odds was successful and tragically lost his life fighting for Queen and Country. And the campaign we did in 2013 was very successful. While we weren't able to get him the military cross, we were able to bring him to the nation's attention and he, since he's been included in uh, school curriculums in, in various parts of Britain. So we're very proud of that and I just wanted to share Walter's amazing story and pay my respects to Walter. Thank you for that, Alex. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, we are out of time now. That's all right. Um, but I, do we have time for me to look at some comments? or are we, are we No, I think we're going to call it a day today, but I just wanted to shout out uh, Sue, uh, Puli, Elisa. My great-great-grandfather was a fisherman and held the world record for many years at the largest fluke court. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she actually has got a picture, but we can't uh, accept them Get at the moment. Get it in the comments afterwards and we'll show so, yeah, it next week. Anyone who's got pictures of their sporting um, ancestors, if you want to post them in the comments, we would love to see them. We might get some up next and actually, week. actually, as we haven't even had time to go through, because I've been waffling, next week we definitely will show off a selection. Of yeah, and I think next ancestors. week we'll, we'll make it a bit of a Q&A. We'll do, we'll do yeah. lots of questions for people watching. And also... If we have time, I've got a very exciting video that I want to do related to someone in the building here. Actually, oh, not in the building. 
yeah. in the States, but someone going yeah. on a very clear no, journey to one. find something to do with their ancestors. I can't really say any more without spoiling it. Okay, cool. So that's everything from us, I think. Yes, well, good luck to England on the match on, the match on Sunday. Hope you all have a lovely weekend, and we look forward to seeing you again next Friday. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Take care. See you. Bye.